Ruth Langmore is one of the most popular characters on Ozark. She grew up dirt poor in a trailer park in the mountains, and she basically raised herself. She's a southern fried Gen Z Rosie the Riveter. She's the best. And in a fair society, she would probably feel lucky or blessed. But she doesn't. She feels cursed. You see, I'm a cursed Langmore. No matter what she does or how hard she tries, there's nothing that she can do to win. But Ruth Langmore isn't cursed. She lives under something much worse, and it's called a poverty trap. And you need to know what's going on because it's applying to more Americans every day. Ozark is the story of a shy town rich guy who launders money for the drug cartels. He's then forced to move to Missouri with his family to launder even more money for him. Now, if you haven't seen it, I don't know why the algo sent you here, but stream that, come back, and we'll be right here. But for those of you who have, let's keep it pushing. Let's start with why Marty picks Ruth to be his partner, because it matters. Why would Marty Bird trust his life and millions of dollars in cash and drugs to a 19-year-old who bangs classic hip-hop? Well, for the same reason that the viewer might. Because while Marty is insecure, unsure, and passive, Ruth is the opposite. They're alike in many ways, but it's clear to Marty and to us that Ruth is superior in some ways that matter most. But where is that gotten her? Not very far. In the beginning of Ozark, she's basically forced to raise herself and her cousins Wyatt and Three because her mom died in a car wreck, her dad's in jail, and her two uncles are criminals too. And each of those male relatives die of brutal violence as the series goes on. This is one of the many traumas that we've watched Ruth endure, and even she knows that at this point it's excessive. My childhood traumas are not like yours. You see? I'm a cursed playing more. Now, even though that sounded the same as it did in the beginning, those are two different clips, and what she said is not nearly as interesting as when she said it. Because this is Ruth near the end of the series, after she went big business, and after she did all the right things to escape her fate, only to find that she's right back where she started. Because this is Ruth after finding Wyatt murdered in cold blood. And why he was killed actually matters to us because Wyatt was similar to Ruth, and his fate gives us more clues that the Langmore curse is actually an American poverty trap. As talented as Ruth is, if asked, she would say that Wyatt was smarter. But why the Ozarks are a playground for rich folks, this is what happens when you become rich and famous. Like the birds, there's nothing but seasonal work for folks like the Langmores. So Wyatt gets into the game and gets dead. Enough said, right? Right. Or something has to be up if not one but two gifted kids in the same family can't make it out. Something's wrong. I'm... The numbers say that there is something up, and the difference between Charlotte Bird and Ruth Langmore gives us another hint at what I'm talking about. See, the difference between Charlotte Bird and Ruth Langmore is that there really isn't any. They're basically the same. While Marty Bird is Ruth's polar opposite, Charlotte is her mirror image. Charlotte is as gifted as Ruth. The only difference between them is their circumstance, not their character. But Ruth is sacrificed just for a chance to end up back where she started. And Charlotte, not so much. Ruth has sacrifices. Charlotte has options. Charlotte has the option to go into illegal business or go legit. She can go to school, vacation, or even back to Chicago if she wanted to. It doesn't matter. Poor little rich girl. And that's the point. Charlotte's life is options with no consequences, and Ruth's life is consequences with few options. This is an environment where no matter how hard the girls work or don't, it's nearly impossible for a girl like Ruth to win as it is for a girl like Charlotte to lose. It's rigged. I'm bought into a rigged game. When the biggest indicator to a kid's success is not biography but geography, the ladder of success is really just a cycle of poverty to nowhere. But before we talk about poverty traps, it's a trap. we gotta know what poverty looks like in America. And it's worse than what you think. In 2020, more than 37 million people, or 11.4% of all Americans live at or below the federal poverty line. But the problem with that number is that 11.4% is complete bullshit because the federal poverty line is stupid low. At $26,200 for a family of four, or $12,760 for an individual, it's hard to think that the government's not trolling you. So in addition to the poor poor, you need to add in the half of U.S. families that are struggling to pay their basic bills due to low incomes or wages. Here's a clear picture of what I'm talking about. About 51% of workers earn a medium wage of less than $35,000 per year. 
currently though, you need to make at least $20 an hour or $42,000 a year to even afford a modest two bedroom apartment on average. Hey kids, do you know why politicians like to use median number instead of average number when it comes to calculating your dough? Because median is average's trifling cousin. An estimated median wage of 35,000 means that half of those wages are under 35,000. And if you think 86 million people making under 35K is wild, in 2019, 44% of all American workers between the ages of 18 and 64 had a median wage of only $18,000. And yeah, there go that median word again. Another part of the problem with poverty in America is that a lot of folks who are living paycheck to paycheck don't consider them themselves poor. And more importantly, neither does the government. Low wage workers get lost in the gap and it's easy to happen. So check it. Here's a story. Let's call them Jack and Diane. They live in Kentucky and have a daughter. He sells cars, she waits tables, and together they bring in about 40k a year. For a family of three, the government puts their number at $23,000 a year. But according to the Economic Policy Institute, Jack and Diane would need to make 53k to make ends meet. That's a $13,000 shortfall that they have to make up every year or else. And with inflation, that number only goes up. Also, neither of those jobs come with things like health insurance, sick leave, or vacation time. If I'm not covered, I got a serious problem. Without savings, people are forced to rely on high interest loans to cover ordinary expenses like car repairs, dental problems, or sicknesses. What was that? We're broke. This drives folks deeper into debt, and once that happens, the trap is set. So now that we know more about us poors, what is a poverty trap? Poverty trap is a term that has been repurposed to describing the experiences of high poverty communities in America. And you call that winning? Yes. When poverty persists in an economy, making it impossible for people to break free, that's a poverty trap. When poverty goes from one generation to another, that's a poverty trap. When the poverty rate has been over 20% for three decades, that's a poverty trap. Basically, it's a cycle of poverty so bad that it forces people to remain poor unless they hit the lottery or come into big money fast. There's a lot of reasons why poverty traps exist, but the major ones are political corruption, poor infrastructure, harsh environments, poor education, and violence in wars. Sound familiar? So how many Americans live in poverty traps? Well, more than you think. About 14 million people in cities, 7 million people in the rural areas, and 6 million people in the burbs. That's right, there's about as many people living in poverty in the burbs as they are in the sticks. You didn't see that coming. So when you add all the number of Americans experiencing poverty, the real number is closer to 60 million people, or damn near double the amount that the government recognizes. Yeah, see no evil, hear no evil. And this matters because what the government doesn't see, it doesn't fund. We talk a lot about poverty in the cities and not much about the poverty in rural and suburban areas. So I'm gonna give you three guesses as to which one gets the funding and which one doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know that one. It, it's awesome. Nearly 25 million Americans live in communities and towns that are persistently poor. And they exist all over the country, from east to west. But you don't have to tell Ruth Langmore that because she's from Appalachian coal country, and it totally qualifies as one. No doubt the Ozarks is a poverty trap. Ruth's town is run by corrupt politicians and gangsters. Any infrastructure investment goes to no-bid glory projects. She grew up in a broken family in a trailer park where she couldn't get an education, and her life has been nothing but violence and wars. But most importantly, all of that has been true for over three decades. The cycle of poverty has become so complete with the Langmores, though, that they've mythologized it. It's now a curse. And some of y'all might feel like you have a generational curse, but that shit ain't magic. How about a magic trick? It's math. And while it's common for us to blame our financial conditions on ourselves or our bad luck like Ruth, the numbers say that what you do doesn't nearly matter as much as where you're from these days. And this matters because in modern America, where you're from is fast becoming exactly where you'll be. And not only that, where your kids and your kids' kids will be. And that's not by curse, that's by design. And it's okay to feel a certain way about that. Thanks for watching the video. You can check out more content if you click that box right there. Make sure to like and subscribe.